So today's lesson is called the Passover with the disciples. The reference scripture we'll be using is Matthew 26 verses 17 to 30. It's really a bit of a continuation from the lesson that Harry taught last week. Uh, they're all coming towards the end of what would be Jesus' life upon this earth and what we call Easter or or maybe more aptly should be called Resurrection Sunday. But this is about the, the Passover that occurs prior to that and and Jesus celebrating that Passover with his disciples. Now, the question I want you to ponder as, as we go through this, uh, I'm not going to ask for a response now or even at the end. Obviously, as, as always, this is an open session. I welcome anyone to, to share at any given time or, or to ask a question at any given time. But the question I want you to ponder is how do you show love? How do you show your love to, to your children? How do you show your love to your parents? How do you show your love to friends, family, husband, wife? And probably, I shouldn't even say probably, but most importantly, how do you show love to God? And as you're thinking about that, I want to read Luke chapter 7, verses 41 to 47. If, if you care to follow along again, that's Luke chapter 7. And I'm going to read verses 41 to 47. It says, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. And I'm reading from the King James Version, by the way. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. This is Jesus talking, obviously. And uh, not, I'm not going to go into all the details, but he's talking. He's at a Pharisee's house, and they're judging this woman who's touching him. In verse 44, it says, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, See you this woman, I entered into your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Now I wanted to read that because I wanted to really drive home the point that loving is about giving. No matter how you show your love to someone, doesn't matter who it is, it's about giving something. Where there's giving time, where there's giving you can really summarize it to time, talent, and resources. Now, obviously, that could mean a lot of different things. Talent could be a good listening ear. It could be good advice. Um, it could be doing something for them. Um, obviously, resources could be financial, or it doesn't necessarily have to be directly financial. Maybe, you, um, maybe you're not giving them monetary gifts per se, but you're doing something that is a sacrifice from, from what you would do either for yourself or for your family. But the, the big point is that loving is giving. In that example we just read, Jesus talked about how this woman gave ointment. To her. She gave her tears. She gave what she had at that time to Jesus. And one point, I've read that verse, I, I've read that passage multiple times. I've read the Bible, I don't know how many times in my life, lifetime so far, three or four times at least. And for some reason, well, until I went back and read it again, it's like, wow, she was kissing his feet. I mean, to, to think about that, 
you know, how many of you are going to kiss your, your significant other's feet? And yet she's kissing who was to her essentially a perfect stranger. Now, it was God in the flesh. I know. I get that. I understand. But still, <laughs> um, to her, essentially, is a, first, is a perfect stranger. It could have been her first time meeting him, and she just heard about him. And she's kissing his feet. But she gave, she gave everything, and that's how God and Jesus equated that to love, that she loved very a lot. So the Passover, as you think about it, is really about God's love. Yes, there was death when you read back through what, the, what happened at the Passover, but the essence of the Passover was God's love for his people. And so this is a lesson about God's love, and hopefully you get something about how we are to reflect that love to others. And just again, to drive home the point, John, the first part, uh, 316, the first part of 316 says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Loving is giving. With that, we're going to go ahead and start in the lesson. And the first part of the lesson is called, Jesus <laughs> sends two disciples to prepare the Passover. In the book, it should be, I believe, on page 41. We're going to read Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 19. Again, for those that might be listening, may not have the book, it's Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 19. Would someone be so kind to read those first three verses for me? I can do it, David. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Brother Harry. Um, Damien, I'm going to read the NIV version. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Thank you. So I want to start the lesson. Um, a lot of this, I pre presume, many have read. Um, and it's this isn't one of those dark, I shouldn't say dark. Um, this isn't one of those, I, I would say, really hidden kind of meanings like a parable where there has to be a lot of deciphering. I, I, I believe that you can read it and you can, you know, un, you can perceive it, understand exactly what, what's going on. So I didn't feel I needed to go into the meaning of, of what was transpiring at this point. But I do want to talk a bit about the Passover. And my first question is, what were the elements of the Passover, and what was the meaning behind those elements? Well, to get the, to get the answer to the first part of the question, what were the elements of the Passover, you have to go back to just before the, trans, uh, just before the Passover occurred. And that, that's in Exodus 12, and you can go jump, jump down to verse 8. Now, I'll read it for you. I don't have it on the screen for those watching, but if you're taking notes, Exodus 12 and 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Now, as we go through, you, you'll see that, a lot of the elements of the Passover still occur. When we, when we eat uh, what we call the Lord's Supper, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, you'll see that we only really do two parts of it. Um, but interestingly enough, one of the parts w was added sometime later, so we'll get to that. But from Exodus 12 and 8, you'll see that it doesn't say specifically there, but if you, uh, if you go back to, I think, verse 7 of Exodus 12, you'll see that it says a lamb. A lamb was to be sacrificed. And so this lamb roast with fire was the first part. Now, what was the meaning behind that? That's symbolic of Jesus. 
John 1, 29, when Jesus was coming and John the Baptist beheld him, he said, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now, that, that lamb that they, that they roasted back then, it wasn't a sacrificial lamb for sin at that particular point in time. Now, they did later on in Exodus in, institute sacrif sacrificing lambs for sin and that kind of thing. But at that point in time, it was for a specific purpose so that the death angel would pass over so that God knew, uh, the death angel knew who was, whose were gods versus who were not gods. Um, but this is symbolic of Jesus uh, being this sacrificial lamb. Now, the next part, it talks about the unleavened bread. And this unleavened bread, what it represents is the removal of sin. And you can you can get that from First Corinthians chapter five, verses six through eight. Again, those taking notes, First Corinthians chapter five, verses six through eight is what I'll read. It says, Your glorifying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So there, there's another reference to Christ being our Passover, that sacrificial lamb. So if, if the first one didn't convince you, hopefully this one does. But then verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So there you see the the equating of leavening being that of sin. In verse 8, talking about malice and wickedness, you know, all things that would be against God or the ways of God. And instead, the unleavened bread being sincerity and truth. So it, again, it has a symbolic meaning that when we eat this unleavened bread, it's symbolic of us, uh, of the removal of sin, the leavening part. And then from Exodus 12 and 8, you get bitter herbs. Now, I couldn't specifically find a uh, a Bible reference uh, where bitter was specifically used, but from many things that I was looking into and, and uh, discerned, the bitterness to me is a reminder of the former things. Uh, you could say it could, it's a reminder of sin. The bitterness kind of reminds you of the bitterness as they're eating. It's, it reminded them of the bitterness of the sin. But at that particular time, it really should have reminded them of the bitterness of the slavery that God was freeing them from from Egypt. Um, the slavery and suffering that they that they that they experienced. But so that's why I believe it, it tends to remind us of the former things, the bitterness of those. Now, the fourth thing that was actually added sometime later, and I couldn't specifically find a reference, perhaps maybe somebody else might know, but at some point in time, wine was actually added. In Exodus 12, it doesn't talk anything about wine. Now, it doesn't say they didn't drink wine, but it did not institute wine as part of the Passover meal. Later on, you can read in Exodus, as, as uh, God's giving the law to them through Moses, he talks about sacrificing a lamb and bringing wine and, and that, that kind of thing. That, that's been added. I don't know if maybe that's when they added it to this feast of Passover or not. But regardless, wine was added. At, now at this point, Jesus is, is getting ready to, to share wine with them. Now, wine, I believe that it is symbolic of the will of God. And we'll we'll get to that in in just a moment. But there were specifically four cups of wine that the Jews you uh, drink during Passover, and it's most commonly theorized how they got to four cups was you, if you go back to Exodus chapter six, verses six through eight. I'm not going to read those verses, but there were four wills. That, that God promised them prior to bringing them out of Egypt. And the, the first will is, I will bring you out. 
And that cup, that first cup, they call the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. And God, in Exodus 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, the next I will he gave was, I will rid you out of their bondage. The third cup, they call the cup of redemption. God promised, I will redeem you. And the fourth cup, they call the cup of praise. I will bring you, and what God promises is that I will bring you to a land, or, or I, I saw some references where they said I will take you as my people. But if you go back and read that, there are there are several different types of things. There's the sanctification, there's the deliverance, there's the redemption, and there's there's the praise that is from those. Four I wills. Now, there's some other theories as well out there. To be honest, I don't know what's 100% correct, um, but they, there's some other theories that the reason why Jews drink four cups is because Pharaoh had four evil decrees. He had slavery. He had murdering of all newborn babies. He had drowning of all the, all the males, all the boys, and he had an order to collect straw for them to make their own bricks. Um, there's another theory out there that the four cups could be uh, the four exiles that the Israelites experienced, uh, being the Egyptian exile first, the Babylonian exile, the Greek exile, and then now what they consider the current exile and the coming of Messiah. Um, personally, I tend to like the, the first one where it's the, the promises of the four I wills, the cup of redemption, the cup of sanctification, the cup of praise, the cup of deliverance. But regardless, they drink four cups of, of wine. Now, this part of the lesson is called Jesus sends two disciples to prepare the Passover. In Matthew chapter 26, it doesn't talk about sending two disciples. Um, he just said, go into the city, verse 18, to say to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand, and, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't say, it doesn't specifically say two people. Um, you have to actually go to Luke chapter 22, verses 3 through 8. Again, for those potentially taking notes, that's Luke chapter two, 22, verses 3 to 8. I'm going to read it for you. But as I'm reading this, uh, what I want you to think about is why do you think Jesus sent only two disciples? He only sent two. Why do you think this? And you should get the answer very quickly. Luke chapter 22, verses 3 to 8. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests, and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Now, just to make sure, I wanted to reset verses 7 and 8, so I want you to see that this is exactly before what we're, uh, what was just read was exactly before what we read in Matthew 26. Verse 7 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go pre and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. So there you see the two disciples being sent. And I think the first part, hopefully you, you caught it, in, in, Luke, in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, where it talks about how Satan had now entered into Judas Iscariot to betray the Lord. Um, I thought this was an interesting point that the book brought out that, again, I've read this many times, but I never really thought about it. He probably sent only the two because he didn't want, he needed to, to have this Passover with the disciples prior to him going to the cross and perhaps if if Judas and others would have known 
before they, uh, where they were going to celebrate this Passover before then perhaps he, he might have been taken before his he, he had this opportunity to have to have this uh, experience with them. So that all I really have for that first part of the lesson. Does anybody else did anybody else get anything else from this or have anything that they like to ask or comment? Okay. I'll take uh, silence as contentment that we can move to the next part. So the next part is Jesus identifies Judas as his betrayer. If someone would be so kind to read Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 to 25, and I have King James Version up on the screen, but you can read New International Version or whatever you have. Okay. okay. I'll read the uh, International Version. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. okay, Matthew 26, 20 through 25, the NIV Version. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it, is, as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him to, if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this, the setup and, the, and this feast or this experience that they're having. On the screen, for those that can see it, there's a the, there's a setup of what would have been at that time where they're having this this feast, and what this is called is called a triclinium, which. Triclinium is a Roman word, which tri meaning three and clinium meaning couches. Couches. You could almost think of like you could almost see that in clinium, C L I N I U M. You could almost see cline like recline, um, like a recliner, so to speak. But anyway, for for those that can't see my screen, I'll describe it for you. What it is is it's a U shaped kind of table and it's very low to the ground it's probably maybe knee height so this uh, the, a lot of us has probably seen the picture of what's called the Last Supper that Leonardo da Vinci painted very popular painting um, that's not really representative of how they would have eaten and enjoyed this meal at this point in time it'd been more this u-shaped table with three couches around and don't think of a couch like nowadays. It's really kind of like three pillows, three large pillows, maybe the size of a couch, but low to the ground so that they could experience this food. And what it's U-shaped because in the middle what would happen is the servers, whoever would be serving them, could come and, and distribute the food from the middle of that table to, to the rest of them. So they'd all be sitting around on each side. Uh, now, the way they would sit... Uh, I think this is a little bit important to, to understand, uh, possibly, to, for us to get a little bit of understanding of, of why things transpired the way they did. The, how they would actually sit on these, they actually wouldn't be sitting down. They actually laid kind of with their head towards the center of the U, uh, and they would lay on the left side. And so they would kind of be laying, you know, kind of staggered, and their right hand would be up so that they could grab their food, grab their wine, grab, you know, whatever it is that they're, they're trying to bring to them. And they would, because they're laying on their side, you know, you'd have somebody, if you're in the middle, you'd have somebody to your left and you'd have somebody to your right, okay? Um, now, as I was reading about this, the Jewish tradition at that time was that 
the host would be on the left side of the U, and they would be in the middle position. So, like, say there were three people on that left side of the U, they'd be in the middle position. And they would have somebody to their left-hand side, and they'd have somebody to their right-hand side. Now, uh, we know through John, the, the Gospel of John, that John was leaning on Jesus' bosom. It talks about that. It talks about the one whom God loves and is referencing himself. So John would have been to Jesus' right-hand side because that's the only way he could have been leaning on Jesus' bosom if Jesus is laying on his left side with his right hand up. Now, the, tradition, or the Jewish tradition was that whoever was on your right-hand side, that was your close friend. So that fits along with Scripture. Now, on the left-hand side, if, if Jesus is considered to be the host, on the left-hand side would have been the person of honor. Now, it's, it's theorized... And again, from all the scripture that you read, it, it seems like it could very well possibly be true. We don't, we don't 100% know, but it's theorized that Judas was on his left hand side, which would tend to make sense because Jesus said in this scripture that he who dips his hand with me in this cup, uh, or you know, in in this yeah, in this cup is the one who will betray me. And if Jesus is on his left and and I'm sorry, if Judas is on Jesus' left with his right hand up, he would have been able to dip his bread into the same bowl as Jesus. So just just kind of an interesting thought, an interesting, interesting study. But uh, I, it is important for you to understand kind of a little bit how they were how they were situated and, and how they're laying. By the way, they, what, they, what, what would have happened is as they're laying, their feet would have been out towards the outer edges so that they don't have their feet um, you know, potentially going into the food and contaminating where they're eating. But as we move on, a question I want you to think about, why did the disciples not know who would betray Jesus? Well, a couple of things. As I just kind of mentioned, John in that situation would have likely been on Jesus' right-hand side. Judas likely on his left hand side, and as Jesus is is expounding to them about he's going to be betrayed and so on and so forth, when when Judas said, "Lord, is it I?" It's it's possible that if he was on his left hand side, he could have said it in in a in a voice where the others would not have heard him say that. And when Jesus responded back to him, um. Either maybe they didn't hear maybe they didn't hear what Judas perhaps said, but we do know for sure if you read the Gospel of John or John's account of what transpires here that they didn't know because John Jesus told Judas what you do go do quickly and it says in John that they didn't understand what that meant they thought because he had the bag of money that Jesus was telling him to go and perhaps buy something for them. Um, or, or give to the poor or something. Uh, it specifically says that in John. I wish I would have written down uh, the exact location. Maybe Harry or somebody might might know. But you can look at the gospel uh, at the gospel of John, and they did not know at that time, despite Jesus telling them uh, or trying to give them indication that Judas was going to be the one to betray him. But why did they? But why ultimately did they not know? There's some. There's my own personal theories, and I'm not speaking that as truth. I'm just trying to give you some potential uh, inclination as to, to what could have transpired. But ultimately, the bottom line is whether, whether what, I, what I'm thinking might be true or not, what is true is that God reveals in parts. God doesn't always give us the full picture or, or everything that we need to know. And that little bit ties to uh, pastor's message today, you know, mind your own business. Whatever God gives you, that's for you. You don't have to worry about what he gave or what he does for somebody else. He gave you your part. Make sure to do your part. But God reveals in parts. It was apparently God saw it right that it was not time for the disciples to know. Perhaps if they would have known that he would have, that Judas would have betrayed, they would have tried to stop him or persuade him not to, not to, uh, not to betray Jesus. 
So maybe that's why God kept it for them. But 1 Corinthians 13, 9 really kind of proves my point. It says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. God doesn't always give us everything. And so whatever God gives us, it's important to stand on what you know, on what we know. Whatever it is God gives you, it's important to do that part. It's important to stand on that part. Now, a further question could be, why does God reveal in parts? Well, there are two potential explanations for that. One, we couldn't handle all of the knowledge if God would try to reveal everything to us. You can read Job 11. Amen. You could read Job 11, verses 7 to 8, if you, if you so choose. I'm not going to read that right now. But basically, it's talking about how the question is being asked, can you find out God to perfection? Can you know every, all there is to know about God? And then, the, and then verse 8 answers, you know, he's as high as the heavens, and, and he's, as, he's as deep as hell. There's, we can't perceive everything about God. It's impossible. So we have to know in part. Um, and number two, if we knew everything is, as he knows everything, then why would we need to rely on him? If, 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 I, if I'm being taught by somebody and I know as much as they do or I know even more than they do, then why are they my teacher? I don't need them to be a teacher. I know more than they do. I should be their teacher. So it's a reminder for, for us that we always will rely on him. And, and that's even why you could take it a step further, uh, going back to what Harry talked about last week, that nobody knows the time of Jesus coming except for the Father. He said, no, not the Son, no, not the angels. Nobody knows. It's a reminder that even everybody, all essence, re relies on God the Father. Now, uh, last question I have on this section. Do you think Jesus despised Judas? What, what do you what do you all think? Did Jesus despised Judas because he knew that he was going to betray him. You know, I thought about that, and and I don't think that he did. I think um, he spent three and a half years on the road with him. They shared meals. They shared time. They shared his te Jesus teaching. Judas had seen the miracles firsthand, and yet he still didn't believe in him. And sometimes it comes down to you just don't want to believe and, you, and who you think Jesus is. And I don't think, well, Judas was, an, uh, was a zealot. And I think that's revealed in John 6, that um, he started to turn early, although they didn't know it at the time. In hindsight, when John was writing it, then he I think he realized it. But I think it hurt him. He had, Jesus had human emotions. And, you know, he was God, but he had those emotions. And I think that it hurts when somebody that's close to you does something to you. It's one thing to have an enemy turn on you. You kind of expect it. But to have somebody that should have known better and had access to all the inside information, things that the average person wouldn't have known at that time, and he still turned. I think he was hurt, and I think he felt uh, I think he had a sense of style about it because of what he said later on when he was said it was better if he hadn't been born. Because I don't think Judas ever repented. He, I know he killed himself, but it doesn't mean he repented. But I think Jesus was, was hurt by it. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. I, I do not, I don't think Jesus despised, uh, despised him at all. Um, and Psalm 41 and 9 says, Yea, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And this is a prophecy about Jesus. Now, now David, I believe, was the uh, writer of Psalm, and, and he was going through his own battles at that point in time. But we, being enlightened by the New Testament, understand that the Old Testament all points to Jesus, and Man. in this in this passage, you can see Judas even said, "My own familiar friend." He called him a friend. He didn't call him my enemy. 
So I think even all the way to the end, Jesus loved him and, and never despised him. And it really fits with Scripture as you think about it, because if he didn't, Amen. If he didn't love him, then why would he tell us to pray for our enemies? Amen. Okay? So just just a little something I wanted to, I don't know, the Holy Spirit Amen. wanted me to bring out. Perhaps, perhaps somebody may be going through a tough situation, loving their enemy or that kind of thing, but... Jesus loved his enemy all the way to the end. And, and what I want, the other message I want to, to portray in that is never let someone, an unbeliever, misunderstand that, that Jesus or, or God is mean, hateful, whatever words they want to say. There's a difference between being hateful and giving some, giving people what they desire. Where I'm going with this is there are people who say, how could a loving God send send people to hell? Well, with, don't have time to go into to all everything about that, but it's not so much that God's desiring to send people to hell. It's that people are desiring to live life without God. I can't worship a God who does this. Okay, well, then that's what you're choosing. And because you don't want to worship God like that, then God gives you what you desire which is life without him. Okay. I think I've said enough there. We will move on for the sake of time. Oh, before we move on, I do just want to pause. Does anybody else have anything else they want to add or any questions uh, from, from that part or anything we've discussed at this point? Okay, I'll take silence as we are ready to move on. So we'll go to what I have as the last section, which is called Remembering Jesus' Sacrifice for Us. And we'll finish off the Matthew 26, and 26 verses 26 to 30. Um, I'll ask for one more volunteer. If, if not, I'll uh, go ahead and read it myself. I'll go ahead and read it. Okay. 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 New International Version. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat this. Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Thank you. Amen. Okay, so from this, we gather from verse 26 that bread it's equated to Jesus. Jesus took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. So so the bread represented of Jesus. The wine represents his blood. From verse 28, this this is my blood. After he tells him to drink, drink of the cup of the wine in verse 27, he says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so the bread is Jesus, the wine is his blood. How could Jesus then bless it? In verse 26, it, it says in the New, New International Version, it says he had given thanks when he had given thanks. In the King James Version, it says, and he blessed it and break it. How could, how could Jesus do this? It's kind of... It's kind of an interesting thought to me that he would announce a blessing upon what was about to happen to him. Well, to a little bit, well, first off, you got to understand that this was the will of God for his life. And Isaiah 53 is a, a perfect example, a perf I should say a perfect summary of why Jesus ultimately came to this earth. And I'm just going to read verses 10 through 11 
Again, that's Isaiah 53 for those perhaps taking notes. Verse 10 to 11, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you shall make his soul an offering for sin. So we know this is talking about Jesus. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. I'm sorry, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. He can add a blessing to it because he understands his purpose. He understands what is his business upon, his, upon this earth. And the, despite this travail that he's about to experience, he blesses it because he ultim his ultimate love for mankind, humankind, is so much that he understands this is a necessity for people to take part with me, which is what he ultimately desires. Now, with that, I have a question. Is the Lord's Supper about eating bread and drinking wine? Obviously, we do a communion where we eat bread and we drink wine. And, and by no means, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not saying we should not do that. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand that I'm questioning that we should do that. Uh, that that's not my intent at all uh, by asking these questions. Rather, I want you to understand that there's perhaps a bit of a deeper meaning behind, behind this. Now... I need to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I need to read verses 24 to 26. Now, we read this sometimes, or many, many churches read this, right before we, we, take, we do our communion service. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, for those potentially taking notes. It says, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Important part here, this do in remembrance of me. Amen. Verse 25, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Now, one part of it is this is, this is symbolic of, of what happened at, at that time. One part of it is that it's, it's showing forth the, what God did, on, what Jesus did on the cross, that he broke his body and he gave his blood for us. And, and by taking, uh, partaking, we, do, we, we remember what he did for us. But I also contend that there's another potential part of this, and that's why I emphasize this do in remembrance of me. What is it that we do? Um, well, I contend that part of us breaking bread is about us sacrificing one for another as Jesus did for, for us. Now, we're not doing it in the sense of of attaining, of trying to attain salvation or trying to sacrifice ourselves for another but we do this because this is how we show forth our love. I talked earlier about loving is giving. So, so what are we giving to our fellow body? Well, we give of ourselves. We give. We get. We we sacrifice our time, talent, our resources, one for another. Drinking wine is about us accepting the will of God in our lives. When Jesus, in in chapter twenty-eight, talked about this is the New Testament. This is this is blood of my New Testament. He gave his blood to give, testament is just another word for a will, a new will. So we accept the will of God, uh, of God in our lives. Whatever God has told us to do, whatever God has instructed us to do, that's what we accept as part of, of our lives. So like I say, I contend that there's a, there's a bit of a deeper meaning behind that. It's not just about eating the bread and drinking the wine. Now, the last part I'm going to finish with, and then we'll be wrapping up here in just shortly, is it talks about a hymn sung, and I, I researched this 
that the hymn that they would have sung at that time, they they called it the Hallel. And Hallel is another word for, or basically it translates to meaning praise. Like, it's spelled H-A-L-L-E-L. -L -E -L. If you're familiar with that part, that's the first part of Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the, what that was, the Hallel was Psalm 113 to 118. And this would be very fitting and should have been a bit prophetical to the disciples at this time, which I'm sure they picked up afterwards, but maybe they didn't understand at that time they were, they were singing this, this hymn. I'm, obviously, I'm not going to read verse. If you go to Psalm 113 to 118, there's a lot of verses in there. But uh, just reading the last part, uh, the last part, verse 22 to 23 and verse 27 of Psalm 118, it says, The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. That's verses 22 to 23 of Psalm 118. Verse 27 says, God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Now, this is the part I want you to, to really pay attention to. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. So all of this, it should have been prophetic that this is what was about to happen to Jesus. He was about to give himself for the people, and he even referenced later on that that he was the head cornerstone of which he, he was a cornerstone of offense to those that don't believe, but a cornerstone of sacrifice uh, of of salvation for those that believe that that believe uh, a cornerstone of which we could build up our found as as our foundation which we could build upon. So, all of this is to say that. As I mentioned earlier, Passover, though there was death that occurred in it, it was really all about being a sacrifice of love. That through God's love for his people that he had done all this. It's through God's love of his people that Jesus sacrificed himself and became uh, the Passover for us. And that's how God gave to us, and that's how God showed his love and that he gave to us. Now, I will pause right there before I wrap this up. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to share or anything, um, any questions? Brother Damien, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's a little faint, but I can hear you. Okay, um, so um, I just wanted to say uh, between Pastor Sermon and Mind Your Business and you with this lesson on uh, loving your enemies up until, um, I just wanted to say y'all really hitting below the belt today. Really, and, you are. Uh, um, I'm us. convicted. <coughs> on both thank, thank you for sharing. Um, and, and it's it's all the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know your situation. I'm not asking to share your situation. But it's all the Holy Spirit trying to work out His will in your life, and just just be obedient to whatever God's telling you to do, and, and He'll pull you through. He'll give you the strength to go through. As pastors repeats about James, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So. <coughs> thank thank you for that testimony. That I will say that it is encouraging for for me that. I understand the God that the Holy Spirit's using me. Amen. Anybody else anything before we move to just this last little quick summation? Okay. So in the book, uh, there's a, they had a section I believe it's called "In Remembrance of Him." I'm not going to read that. If you have the book, you you can certainly read that. But what I wanted to just encourage us, I wanted to use John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, where it talks about a new commandment I give unto you, 
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So we are to love one another in remembrance of him. And I've said it once, I've said it, I don't know, three times, four times in, in this lesson. Loving is giving. And we got to understand also that perfect love casts out fear. Fear to fear to love our enemies because we maybe we might think that they oh if we just do this they may hurt us. Fear of wh whatever the fear is. I'm not going to go off on on a tangent and talk about various different forms of fear. Whatever it is you're fearing, perfect love casts out fear. And when you when you trust God and and understand that God loves you, that He will not let any harm come to you then you'll be able to, to love as he loved us. And this is what we are to do in remembrance of him. And that concludes the lesson that I prepared today. I'll open up one last time. Actually, bear with me just one moment. I'm going to stop the recording.